All right, I guess we can start then because it's nice and hot outside. I know you guys are all cool. Thank you guys for joining us. We're going to have a very intimate conversation about what the future of learning looks like. Uh, Michael, who organized this, reached out and said that it'd be a really good idea to, instead of doing a boring presentation, have a conversation with someone who's deeply entrenched in what the future of learning looks like. Um, so just to kick us off, I have a few really short, rapid-fire questions for you, Adam, um, so the rest of the audience gets to know a little bit about you and your background, but to kick us off, can you tell us your full name and age, if you're comfortable sharing your age? Uh, Adam Anbar, I'm 33 years old. Um, where did you grow up? Uh, a little all over the place. I was born in Miami. I lived in Israel for a few years as a kid, and then I kind of mostly grew up as a teenager in New York. Can everyone hear him? What type of schools did you go to? Public, private? Mostly private. Um, on, uh, on scholarships, education was really important to my family, even though my parents are immigrants and we never really had a lot. Um, we usually picked where we ended up moving based on the schools. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, can you tell us if you played any sports as a kid? Yeah, I played soccer, um, which I, you could probably tell. And, um, uh, and I snowboarded a bunch when I moved to New York. Interesting. Would you, is that why you went to college somewhere upstate? Can you tell everyone where you went to college? I went to college at Cornell. Uh, I went there because... Um, uh, this is kind of getting into the problems in education. I get there. I went there because I, it was the best school I could get into in my head, and I didn't really think much about what college I should go to or why. I just kind of looked at the rankings and was like, "All right, that one." And what did you study while you were there? Policy analysis. Don't ask me what that means. <laughs> I also went to Cornell, so Adam and I shared an alma mater. Um, very similar to you, decided that was the best school I could possibly get into, wound up going there to study hotel management, and then found myself also in education. So I think we have these twists or turns that are very similar. Um, I asked those shorter questions just to give you guys all a sense of the fact that um, Adam and I are both human, um, and you guys have just as big a role to play in influencing the future of education as we do. Um, so let's jump in. I'm gonna ask a, a questions that are a little bit more challenging. Um, I'd like the audience to get a sense of your education story. So can you tell us what role education played in your life and whether or not, or actually when you discovered that education was important? Yeah, so uh, I guess it's a little hard to answer without telling you guys what I do. So I run a school in New York called the Flatiron School that teaches people software engineering. It's a really intensive program. We put people through in kind of an intense all day, every day education. It lasts three to five months. Uh, and then we get people jobs as software engineers. Um, so how does one get there? Uh, and I can tell you more about that too. But um, my uh, education background is, like I said, it's always been important to my family, even though I'm the first one of a big family to go to college. Um, I moved around a lot as a kid, went to college upstate, uh, worked uh, in a bunch of jobs that had nothing to do with what I studied in college. Uh, so I ended up going to business school um, because I figured maybe I'll learn a real skill there that I can use. Um, and I learned about a lot of things, but uh, I didn't really have, uh, I didn't learn a skill. Um, I didn't feel like I could walk into a place and say, here's what I could do for you. Now I have this skill. Um, and uh, so I left there. I worked at a few other companies, ended up starting the Flatiron School. Uh, but even kind of outside of education, I'd always been involved in education. When I was at Cornell, I taught first grade at a, a charter school in Brooklyn for a semester. Uh, when I was in uh, business school in Boston, I was uh, volunteering teaching entrepreneurship at a prison. Um, so I've always been close to education. But you said you were the first one in your family to go to college. So how did the, I guess, what was the emphasis or who put the value of education onto you? Did your parents just sort of say, we didn't have an education and we want to make sure that you get it? Or was it something you were looking to fill? Yeah, um, I think, I mean, my parents were always like, go to college, get an education. It's important. Uh, I, I see a lot of kids here and a lot of adults. Um, Hopefully, it's not like kids and parents, because otherwise <laughs> some people might get mad at me. But I think, I think um, uh, you know, the reason they place so much emphasis on it is because that's the American dream, right? Go to college, get a degree. Doesn't matter what you study. Study what you're passionate about. Doesn't matter how much it costs. Take, take out as much debt as you need to, because you go to college, you pay for it, you will be fine. 
Um, that's what we're told, and it's just simply not true anymore. Um, but that's why my parents, like many other people's parents, just said, just go to college, just go to college, just get a degree, nothing else matters. Um, and I didn't think much about what school, what I wanted to study, how it would impact me. Um, I, think, I think a lot of parents, a lot of kind of our culture points people in that direction. A lot of the way we think about high school success is are we getting kids into college without even wondering if that's the best idea. Okay, I, I only asked to elaborate a little bit more on that because that's the common sense perspective that we sort of take when we're thinking about the next generation of people who are going to our schools. Um, my parents are also immigrants, but I think we had the opposite sort of effect where my mom didn't understand anything about the public school system or the American public school system for that matter. And so it wasn't just sort of ingrained in us that education was important or should be valued. Um, so I think it's interesting from that perspective. You touched a little bit about what the, on the Flatiron School and sort of what it does, but can you give the audience over here a little bit more perspective as to what the founding story was like? Um, what was that moment that pushed you to start the school and where are you guys today? Yeah, so um, I was working in venture capital, investing in startups, and I decided I wanted to invest in higher ed. Or it, it dawned on me that there was an opportunity to make education better, right, through technology. Um, and I realized that you know there was a there was a problem kind of brewing in that the return on investment in education just doesn't make sense anymore. It used to make sense, and if you look at historical data, it made a lot of sense. But today. It just doesn't. In fact, it only works for about 15% of the population, um, right? Half of our country goes to college, half of them graduate in six years, half of them work in a job that requires a college degree. It's pretty simple math. Um, don't get me wrong, college is amazing. I've loved it. Um, but it's only right for a certain type of person. And it, I realized that for some reason in our country, higher education equals college. And everybody needs a higher education. That doesn't necessarily mean it has to be delivered in that way. And so I asked myself whether we can create a system that delivers a higher education in a different way that's better suited for a different type of person with a different background and a different uh, context. Uh, and so that's what we build. It's, um, uh, like I said, we train people in very, um, very intense, very efficient environments for specific roles in companies um, and get them great jobs. You were telling me earlier you started the company four years ago. How many students have you guys had go through your schools now? How yeah. big are you guys as an organization? So, you know, we have a campus uh, down in um, uh, the financial district. We also teach people online. Um, you know, when it's kind of a bold idea to say we're going to create the future of higher education, create a new educational model. Uh, and so when we started, we said, okay, we have, we have to do three things. The first thing we have to do is prove efficacy. We have to prove that we can actually do it. And so we admitted a class of 20 students um, with totally different backgrounds, investment bankers, uh, college dropouts, construction workers, um, a major league baseball player. Um, and we got them all jobs. The average salary was $75,000 a year. Um, after a three-month program, none of them had any background in software engineering coming in. Um, we grew from there, um, and we started running more and more classes, and then we realized step two was to focus on accessibility. So it's not, like, it's interesting if you can get people jobs, and uh, especially these cool tech jobs really quickly with this intense training, but really education is about the promise of a better life, right? It's about economic mobility, about giving people opportunity to kind of propel themselves upwards in the world. And so the next question we ask ourselves is, can we do this for people that don't have the privilege and the background that we have for people that grew up in the South Bronx, got a GED, and maybe worked in retail for a couple of years, and that's it. Um, so we started these fellowship programs with the city of New York, where the city fully funds the tuition of those students. Um, programs were longer. They were redesigned to fit the assumptions we could make about those students and, and what they knew coming in. But we got the same outcomes. Um, remarkably, people, you know, entire classes full of students from low-income backgrounds without college degrees or from immigrant families. Um, same outcomes, five months all day, every day, um, really high-paying jobs. So numbers, thousands so, of kids so, are... Yeah, so we've graduated about um, at least a 1,000 people uh, and placed them into jobs so far. Um, we'll probably graduate another 1,000 this year, so we've been ramping. So you hinted at this like concept of it being bold, of reforming what the future of learning is. And actually, in preparing for this discussion with you, I read this Harvard Business School interview where the interviewer asked you, the, he said, finish the sentence, essentially. The Flatiron School is, and you boldly stated, the future of higher education. Um, so 
I, I think it's okay to be bold, and I think you need to be bold when you're trying to redefine an area or a scheme of things. Um, but after I read that line, I started to think to myself, why does higher education need to be reformed? Right? Like, it's clear that it isn't working for everyone, but is the system working for the people who designed it? Um, and, and maybe not, but can, can you tell us a little bit more about why you think it needs to be reformed? Yeah, I mean, I, I could talk about that for hours. <laughs> um, but, you know, when we think, like I said, when we think about education in our country, like, why does the government provide financial aid? Why does, why, why does the government invest in education? Because ultimately, this country is built on the idea of equality of opportunity. And opportunity is created through education, right? It's not a magic bullet, but if you get a great education, you get great skills, presumably you can get great opportunities. But that doesn't work when education is designed as a one-size-fits-all system, right? When you have an education system that's built to serve people who grew up with wealth, who grew up with certain, certain uh, economic advantages, and you take people without those advantages and put them into that system, of course they're not going to be successful. So of course our educational system doesn't work for most of America. Um, even the people who it does work for, it could be delivered much more effectively, but I don't really care about those people, right? Princeton grads will be fine whether or not they're wasting their money. I care about the other 80% of America. Um, in terms of them, yeah, you know, take a step back and think about how you would des design higher education from scratch today if you had to do that. It certainly wouldn't take four years arbitrarily. It certainly wouldn't be involve you know, all the giant cost infrastructure that college campuses have, and it certainly would, involve, would not involve limiting students to only the content that is delivered through the people employed at that one institution, right? If you were gonna imagine what a future of higher education should look like, what a better system might look like, um, we can paint that picture, right? So, you know, imagine you were, um, I don't know, imagine you want to hire a marketer to work at your company, right, a junior marketer. So you can hire somebody from the traditional route. Let's say somebody goes to NYU and gets a BS in marketing, and this person had a couple of internships, so she was able to get some experience and pay down a little bit of her debt. She graduated with $20,000 in debt instead of $40,000 in debt, right? So now you have a student who has a BS in marketing from one of the best marketing programs in the world, 20 grand, 20 grand in debt, a couple of internships, and that's what she's done for four years. That is probably your best case scenario for being a marketer, right? That is amazing. But imagine this different system. Imagine somebody who comes out and says, okay, um, after graduating high school, I'm going to go to an intense, let's say, coding boot camp and learn how to code for three months so well that I can actually really build things. Then I'm gonna go volunteer in Haiti for six months. And while I'm volunteering in Haiti, um, I'm gonna take some liberal arts classes, but I'm not gonna take liberal arts classes from one place. I'm gonna take them from the best of the best content providers in the world. I'm gonna take the best philosophy class in the world from, from Yale Online and the best physics class in the world from MIT Online. And because technology exists, I can find other people in Haiti with the same ideas I do and have a discussion group with them. Maybe even chip in and hire um, a PhD student to foster, uh, to, to foster real collaborative discussion. And then maybe from there, I go, because I'm interested in marketing, I go to Madison Avenue and take an intensive marketing class while doing an internship. And I continue doing that for three years. And I have, real-world experience. I've, I haven't just read marketing textbooks. I've built a blog and a social media following and done performance analytics. I've had internships. I've had international experience. Right? When you ask what's better for the student and who the employer would rather hire and what's more cost-effective, I think all of these answers are obvious compared to what our best-case scenario is today, which is four years in one place with a ton of debt and a very arbitrarily defined curriculum. I'm going, let, I'm going to let him answer that question, but we're now taking questions from the audience. If you guys want to tweet at us later, you can. Um, so just laying the ground rules there. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I, so, okay, so uh, the question was essentially that, uh, you know, as a hiring manager, when I get a resume with somebody who says NYU on it, I have some confidence in that as a signal for what you've accomplished and what you're able to do, whereas, you know, how do I know in, you know, your made-up model that you haven't just been kind of you know, joking around for three years. That is an awesome question. Um, I'm glad you asked it. My wife runs HR at a company called Birchbox, and I talk to her about this all the time, right? Like, how do you, you know, how do you screen all of these resumes? You work at such a cool company. 
Um, that is, I think, one of the biggest problems, and for future founders out there, one of the biggest opportunities in our country today. Um, you know, we have a social network, which is Facebook, right? Like, we know who you know. We have a professional network, which is where you've worked and who you've worked with. There is no knowledge graph. There is no way today to say, how do I find somebody with these specific skills in a validated way? And unfortunately, because we don't have that, we rely on credentials or proxies for skill. And, you know, when you look at it, and, and that is, I think, the core of the problem, right? When you look at um, a bachelor's in computer science from NYU, in total, over those four years, you have to spend less hours taking computer science classes than you do in our three-month program, right? And I'll, I'll also add that the interview process needs to change, and it already has been. I mean, millions of people have been graduating with CS degrees or engineering degrees yeah. for so several decades, and employers have now said, just because you have an engineering degree doesn't mean that you know Java well, or CSS. I mean, this is even crazier. I could go to NYU and take two years full, two full years worth of marketing classes, 20 marketing classes, and then something happens, I have to go take care of my family, healthcare issues, I have to drop out. I have nothing, I, have, I don't have a degree, I have zero credit. Whereas somebody else can go to NYU and take the eight required marketing classes and then a bunch of easy classes and skate and they have a degree. And that's crazy, right? I'm in debt, I don't have a degree, I took way more marketing classes than the other person, but I had a financial hardship, I had a situation, and remember, it's probably not true of the people in this room, but we're not talking about the people in this room. More than 50% of people that enroll in college do not graduate in six years, right? So when we think of college, most likely we're thinking about four years at some cushy institution. That's not what real higher education is like in America, right? It's hard, it takes way longer than four years, and most people don't finish and they get zero value out of that. So the reason we start with software engineering is because those skills are transparent, right? Because an employer can look at that and say, Okay, you can build. I don't care what you learned or where you learned it from. I know that you can get the job done. And the, the truth is, as technology um, infiltrates our daily lives in the workplace, that's becoming easier. Today, if, I, if I'm a marketer and I want to hire an entry-level marketer, sure, BS and NYU and marketing is awesome, for sure. But if you don't have that, I can, I can show you a Google Analytics chart and ask you how you might analyze that. You can show me your blog and show me how you've done A-B testing on your email lists and prove um, your ability to get a job done. So more and more, I think it's, it's, it's becoming easier and easier to validate and signal your skills without a, a credential. Because all an NYU degree is, is it's not even, like we just said, it's not even a signal that you did well at NYU or what you learned. All it means is you got into NYU and could afford it. And I think the concept you touched on earlier was this idea of equality, which is what our American like education system has been premised on or based on. Um, it doesn't touch as much on equity, right? And the, the difference between equity and equality is in meeting someone where they are and providing the resources that they need to have that level of playing field. Right. So but that's, I, I mean, I said a quality of opportunity. Which exactly. Is and I think the bigger issue is that it's not based on equity and should be based on equity. Because if we talked about equity, we think about the way we position ourselves in education a lot differently. What sort of skills does that individual need versus what skills do we need to provide for everyone to be able to do a blanket job or whatever it may be? Um, so jumping into the next question, I think we're both entrepreneurs, and as entrepreneurs, we tend to think of you in the term, in like in utopian, t in utopian ways. This is what I our ideal world would look like if we could snap our fingers tomorrow. This is what our vision for higher education would be, um, but that's not the reality. Especially when you're working in education, education is very bureaucratic. So whatever level of cultural like pushback we were going to get in education is usually five or ten times more. Um, I mean, if you ask your, the person sitting next to you after this session what well, they think the, the premise or the purpose of an education is, I bet you guys would be contemplating or debating for anywhere from five to ten minutes. Um, so what sort of shifts do you think are realistic in the next five or ten years, and what kinds of shifts, I guess, will impact the people here in the audience today? Um, well, I mean, you'd say parents with young kids could probably start stressing less about saving for college tuition. Um, uh, the price of college in, in America has, written at, has risen at 5x the rate of inflation for the past 15 years. By definition, like according to the rules of math, it is impossible for that to continue. Because that would mean that higher education as an industry would be bigger than the entire national economy at some point. It is just not possible. Which means um, 
the prices are going to have to come down. They're going to have to change. The system is, is and it's already happening. Um, you're starting to see some schools go out of business, some schools merge. Um, and at the same time, because of that, um, uh, higher education is going to have to be delivered in a lot of a more efficient way. And you think it will happen? Yeah, I think it has to, uh, by definition, in the next five, ten years. Um, I think also, uh, like you said, there's, a, there's an interesting question. It's still the purpose of higher education. I think um, I, I tremendously value the liberal arts, not just as an intellectual pursuit. I think it helps you do vocational work better. I think you are a better accountant if you've studied philosophy. Um, uh, but um, but I think you know we have to, we're on two sides of a pendulum right now, right? There's vocational school, which is kind of a dirty word, and then there's pure liberal arts, and those institutions rarely mix and they rarely talk to each other. In fact, they kind of snicker at each other. Um, and I think it it should be pretty obvious that we should be doing a little bit of both, right? That there is value in liberal arts to people who are just interested in a vocation, and that should be infused in that. And if you're going to go to college for four years and study you know, whatever, liberal art, you know, sociology, philosophy, whatever, the school should probably res be responsible for carving out some portion of time where they make sure you have the ability to pay that back. And that's also happening. You're seeing more and more schools be conscious of um, um, career outcomes and ultimately student loan defaults, right? Like schools are realizing and the government is realizing that they can't just continue enrolling students, putting them through these uh, programs and leaving them with crushing debt and no ability to so those things will lead to shifts. And I know we're, we're out of time. If people did want to get in touch with you, how could they reach you, Adam? Um, I'm Adam at flatironschool.com or A N bar on Twitter or just come find me. I'll, awesome. I'm, I'm here. Thank now. you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>